Today on The State of Us, looking back at the major decisions by the Supreme Court and where the public stands on those decisions. The Supreme Court term that ended just recently concluded with a series of muscular six to three decisions divided along partisan lines with the court's six Republican appointees in the majority. Those rulings on affirmative action, student loans and equal rights for gay Americans were reminiscent of the transformative conservative decisions issued last June on abortion, guns, religion, and climate change, according to a report from The New York Times. But the latest term as a whole included some notable decisions in which the court's three Democratic appointees were in the majority including ones on Voting Rights Act, the role of state legislatures play in federal elections and Native American adoptions. So today we're going to look at a uh, slew of different Supreme Court decisions and where the public stands on those decisions. Some of these, the public is firmly on the side of the court, and some of them we're going to see the public is firmly against the court. In fact, uh, in one case where the court uh, voted uh, unanimously, and the public was almost on the opposite spectrum of the court. So we're going to look and talk about all of that. Welcome to the State of Us. I'm your host, Justin T. Weller, joined today by the one and only, your friendly redneck liberal and the senior resident historian here at True Chat, Mr. Lance Jackson. Well, it's been a long, hot summer already for many of us, and we're just slogging through all of these Supreme Court decisions. It is interesting, though, we need to remember that the reason the Supreme Court is appointed for life or until they decide they want to retire and not elected is because they are not supposed to be swayed by public opinion. They are supposed to read the Constitution and then apply it to whatever the case is and their interpretation of such to the decisions that they make. So, it's interesting, you know, that most of the time in this this summer, they seem to have been on the side of the public, but that's not their intention and that's not why they're there. And that's why we, according to our founding fathers, don't get to vote on them is because we wanted a separate judiciary. But it will be interesting because I think most people will find it interesting when we start talking about these decisions, what the mood of the country actually is according to the survey and the polls that go with this New York Times piece. Well, and and part of that, right, is it's not, oh, well, because the public feels differently and the court voted differently, you know, everything's out of whack. One of the things you're going to find as we go through this is that a lot of the time, the court's decision is one that is agreed with, even if by a tiny majority, or the country's very evenly split on it. You know what I mean? So it's not... There's not a lot of cases, and there's a couple standout ones we're going to talk about where the court has has basically made a decision that is like vehemently the opposite of what the public feels. Um, that does not happen super frequently. So the first one's the big one. I mean, we've done shows on this. It obviously, has drawn a lot of attention. Um, the affirmative action vote. So that was a six to three, basically along the conservative liberal block ideological lines of the court, um, and. We talked about this, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. We did a good show on it. But 69% of all Americans um, agree with the court decision on private colleges um, because that was the way that the question was asked. The survey found nearly identical results by wider margins opposing affirmative action at public colleges, um, which is why they used the private one because it was – it's actually – yeah, it was wider margins for the public universities versus private um, what was the the Democrat and independent vote with that? Because this yes, it breaks also that breaks down. it down that way. So it's fifty eight percent of Democrats agree with the court's decision. Seventy two percent of independents agree. And I think that would surprise most people. Yeah, that, that I talk to, you know, mm -hmm. that are in my circle of family and friends, um, because many of them were upset with this decision. And so when you read that, at least according to the survey, and we all know. Well, we can wean from polls and things, but I found that very interesting that almost 60 percent of Democrats and over 70 percent of independents sided with the court on this decision concerning affirmative action. Yes. I mean, you know, 
58 percent, 60. Oh, I'm fudging it. Two more points. But I would have if you had asked me before, mm-hmm. I would have said a minority right. of Democrats would have agreed with this decision. And that's I was not surprised so. too. So that that surprises me. And when we talk in the, for an upcoming election, how important the independent voters are going to be, I think it's it's very interesting when you look at it and something to remember when we get more into election season after the first of the year that 72% of independents agreed with this decision. So just something to put on the back burner, not a lot there right now, but just kind of Think about that and use it when we get into the, you know, more into the presidential election. Because um, that independent vote, that where the independents well, stand huge, on right? a lot of this stuff is is important to keep in mind. Because when we're listening, a lot of the people to this show obviously follow politics more closely. But when when we're listening to what the parties say, think about how is what is what they're saying, either party aligning with what independents, forget about their bases, but how aligned are they? On a lot of these issues that independents, you know, have opinions. Well, remember, about. historically, we've always talked about it uh, on this show. Forty percent. It doesn't matter who you run. Forty percent of the people are going to vote for the Democrats, and forty percent of the people vote for the Republican. Even if you have a landslide winner, the popular vote is still forty to forty. It's that twenty percent that makes the difference. So that's why you focus in on the independents. So student and that group is getting bigger, right? Yes, now, it's a growing at this, at this point in our history. That's growing. a growing part of the electorate. Student loans was a six to three decision along the same lines as affirmative action. The court ruled that the Biden administration's plan to wipe out more than four hundred billion dollars in student debt was not authorized by Congress. Um, so again, this was along uh, pretty much the expected liberal conservative lines. Um, the public. Uh, and this one's interesting because the public was 50-50 on this. 50% agree, 50% disagree. 73% of Democrats disagree with the decision, while 72% of Republicans agree with the decision and independents fairly split at 53%. So it shows you how you get the 50-50 divide. Um, I guess I would say... I mean, they're on opposite ends of the spectrum. Yeah. The two political groups are... I mean, <laughs> they are opposite on this on this issue. And yeah. That's... That's very that's very interesting um, when, and, you, when you think about it. And I think the 50-50 split of the country, though, should tell us, and you know, we don't have time to discuss really lots of solutions to this today, but it should tell us that clearly we haven't found the correct, clearly the parties have not attempted the correct solution yet to the college equation because there are lots of Democrats who clearly feel that there is a serious problem you know, with student debt and they want to see forgiveness. And there's clearly a lot of Republicans who don't think that that's the right answer. And the country is very divided on this particular way of attempting to solve it. And we've even talked before about the notion that, you know, student loan forgiveness, right, just as an idea does not fix anything about college. Now, that doesn't mean that there's maybe not space for it in the conversation. But I think that it misses the bigger point of that's that doesn't fix the ongoing issue. And and to that, there is word now coming out this summer that President Biden is now trying to put in place. Um, I shouldn't say put in place, but to effectively look at the law that says you can't pay on you shouldn't have to pay on your loans for more than twenty or twenty five years. And that they're not going to now create a new law since the Supreme Court's made this decision, but they're going to go back and look at the rolls and wipe off the loans that people owe who have paid for at least 20 years, which is allowed by the law. We've always always said, if you don't like the decisions, change the law. So now it looks like the government's going to go back and enforce the original intent of the law as a way to help those people that have been paying on student loans for 20 plus years. The religion, free speech, and gay rights, again, a six to three decision by the conservative bloc, traditionally conservative bloc of the court. The court decided that the First Amendment allows a web designer who objects to same-sex marriages to violate a state law that prohibits discrimination based on sexual orientation. The ruling is that the First Amendment allows business owners to bypass state laws that prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation. 
the this the article doesn't say this, but I'm just expanding on this for folks. So the the ruling basically was using the logic, right, that the um, Constitution of the United States is superior to the uh, any any state law or any state constitution. So even if a state law says that you can't do this, if somebody's claiming that the Constitution of the United States says they can do this, then it doesn't matter what your state law says because the Constitution supersedes it. So that those are the grounds as far as where the public stands on this. 51% of voters, so this is kind of like the last one, 51% agree with the court. 66% of Democrats disagree with the court. 66% of Republicans agree with the court. And 54% of independents agree with the court. This is, again, I think another one of those issues kind of like the last one of, I don't think this is going away. Um, you can, you can make decisions like this, but then that, again, it, it kind of throws it back on the legislative agenda of what are we going to do? Right. Well, I mean, and it we, comes back to two, the freedom of businesses to do what they want, but then the freedom of the consumer of where you want to take your business. Right. Because it just doesn't affect a certain group of people. It also affects me as a consumer. Maybe I do or don't want to do business with your company if you take these kinds of political stands. So there's more than one way to solve it. You did a nice job of explaining why the court felt they had to rule the way they did because they're just looking at, you know, the whole concept that federal law is supreme right. uh, in against any other law. So, yeah. I mean, I, in some ways, I guess I'm kind of... I, I shouldn't be surprised, I guess, that it was a six to three decision. I guess I'm kind of disappointed that it is because I think I'm not a legal expert, but as if if I had been asked to make the decision, what I would want the decision to be versus what I think the court's job in making the decision is are not the same thing. Exactly. I I I would be in the share of the public that says, even though even though I disagree with a business doing that, and I don't think that the federal law should be the way that it is, I think what the federal law says right now, and the argument being used that the U.S. Constitution is superior to any state's law, it really doesn't matter what the state's law is or how right we think it is, is probably the correct decision. Um, but again, that goes back to, like I've said, it was like the, the Roe v. Wade thing. If we don't like it, we're getting upset with the court. The court's not the place to fix it. The Congress has the authority to do some things here that would make it so that the court doesn't have to deal with this. And, we've, and we've Congress added isn't doing it. We've added amendments to the Constitution Lots of since times. it <laughs> went into existence. Uh -huh. So and, and that's not as big a deal as people Most make of the times that we add amendments to the Constitution, they deal in some way with the rights of our citizens that we want to better codify. You know, I mean, so... It's not like this would be an absurd thing if, if we feel strongly about it as a nation to take care of it. Um, no, I don't like the court's decision, but it, I think it also is difficult to say if you're looking at it just from the purely legal component to say that they made an incorrect decision based on how you would view the law. State legislatures and federal elections are one, what we're going to look at next. This was a six to three decision, but it's not along the lines that you would think. Keep it here on The State of Us, and we'll be right back. State legislatures and federal elections, a six to three decision by the court rejected a legal theory that would have given state legislatures largely unchecked power to set the rules of federal elections. Yes, it was six three, but unlike in the first segment of the show where all six three decisions were along the same lines, this one was not. The liberal block of the court, um, Justice Sotomayor, Kagan, and Brown Jackson sided with Justice Roberts, K Kavanaugh, and Amy Comey Barrett um, to create a six to three uh, majority that came up with this decision. The court rejected that legal theory that giving states, um, basically the state's argument was that the way the constitution reads is that state legislatures, basically regardless of their own state's laws and regardless of federal law, get to just decide however they want how districts, how congressional districts are drawn in their state. And the court's decision was saying, no, that is not what the constitution means. If you have a, for example, if your state constitution, and Ohio is a good case of this, 
has an amendment that was passed, you know, like by the voters and says, this is how districts have to be drawn. The state legislature can't just say, yeah, we don't want to do it that way. You have to. Right. Your legislature is bound by your law. Right. right. There's not a federal law that dictates it. But the Supreme Court is saying to the states, if you have a law that says this, you have to follow it. Right. You can't. Wow. What a novel concept. (laughs) You can't break your own But it does also show us, you know, that there is a little bit, and I, wrong word to use with the court, but there is a little bipartisanship here. There is. It's not, you know, and people get so worked up. And now there are strong members of the court who will always vote, you know, sure on a, on a liberal agenda. And then you have Justice Alito and Justice Thomas who will always vote on the conservative side, which is why the 9-0 vote that we're going to get to at the end of the show is very interesting. It's very notable. It's, you know, because <laughs> they're really, that very rarely happens. You have yep. a lot of independent thinkers on the Supreme Court and they don't care what the other side says. Yeah. They know so what they- So you get they, a 9-0. Yeah. So, you know, but it's interesting here that it was a coalition of appointees that came up with this decision, which- ought to make all of us feel more comfortable. As far as the public goes, 55% agree with the court, um, 61% of Democrats, 53% of independents, and 50% of Republicans. Um, Some people think that the language in the Constitution means that only state legislatures can regulate federal elections without oversight from state courts. Other people think that the state courts can exercise this oversight as they do in other areas. And the Supreme Court's decision is basically saying, yes, state courts can exercise authority over state legislatures drawing of their maps to enforce state laws. Um, so race and voting maps. And I mean, if anybody's wondering, I'm, I think this is one of those. There's a couple decisions here that have not gotten a lot of attention because of the other socially charged ones. This is one that I think deserves way more attention than it gets because this is a if this is one of those that if it had gone the other way, right? Huge the ramifications would be oh huge. Oh my gosh. I mean, every the news cycle would have been totally different because or it should have been. I mean, affirmative action, like all this stuff would pale in comparison to if this had been decided the other way in terms of what it would have done to open up basically the floodgates of our far right and far left states to, I mean, who knows what they would have started doing, you know, the minute that it was basically, we've given the states an unchecked authority to determine how federal elections are going to take place in their states. Um, And that would have been, I mean, it would have been, who knows, you know, who knows how it would have gone. It would have been the wild west of elections. And we think we've seen some of that Uh, lately. No, This would have changed it. This would have changed it. Race and voting maps. Five to four decision. So a very similar group um, as the last decision. Amy Comey Barrett, Justice Amy Comey Barrett, was the one that did not join this time. So it was five to four with Kavanaugh and Roberts joining uh, Jackson, Kagan, and Sotomayor. The court ruled that Alabama had diluted the power of black voters by drawing a congressional voting map with a single district in which they made up a majority. 53% of Americans agree with this, 65% of Democrats, 52% of independents, and 61% of Republicans disagree. One-fourth of Alabama's voters are black. Alabama recently created seven congressional districts, with only one of them being a majority black district. Some people think that the small number of districts in which black voters are a majority violates Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, which bans racial discrimination in voting policies, and that the state should be forced to redraw the districts. And the ruling was that, uh, basically, that the court agreed with this interpretation that... um, they had un unlawfully diluted the power of black voters in Alabama by by disproportionately representing them and clumping them into a single district to avoid giving them more authority. Well, and what you just said there, <clears throat> very quickly, but you quoted the Voting Rights Act. There's a federal law. I mean, to try to just emphasize the role our, our here point of our, how this of, works. Okay. We always thought, well, you need a law. You need a law. Well, here's a law. Voting Rights Act is a law passed by Congress Congress back in 1965. So 
the Supreme Court saying, here's the law and we have to enforce the law. So in these other cases, if you don't like what the Supreme Court has decided to Justin's point that he keeps emphasizing, then we need to write a better law. So then the courts have to go along with it because when the courts have to go along with the law, yes, it's a 5-4 decision, but it's still sided with that interpretation of the Voting Rights Act taking from Republican nominees and Democratic nominees. So the system does, I guess the main point is the system does work. We, we don't, sometimes we don't like what they decide, but the system works and. Well, and part of the point is they don't have to care if we like it or not. Well, and, they, and that's why they're not elected. Right. But it makes that emphasis change the law. Right. If you don't like the decision, you don't like it, change the change law. the law, not yeah. the Supreme Court, change the law. Tribal rights is the next one, a seven to two decision. Um, this one, I, I'm just glad that it's included in the list. I'm not saying that I think the decision is necessarily the right one, but I'm glad that it's included in the list because it's easy to overlook these. And the Supreme Court frequently makes rulings, you know, uh, on tribal issues that have big impacts, maybe not on me or not on Lance, but we've tried to cover those things in depth on this show because they're important to us. The court upheld the Indian Child Welfare Act, which is a 1978 federal law that seeks to keep Native American children with their tribes and preserve their heritage. But the ruling did not resolve whether the law discriminated against non-Native families based on race. In 1978, Congress enacted a law that says Native American children who are removed from their families should be placed with extended family members or foster homes of people who are also Native American. Some think this law discriminates on the basis of race. Others think it does not discriminate on the basis of race. The court's ruling upholds the law and says that, uh, yes, you know, the, the law, they didn't answer the question of whether or not the law is discriminating based on race. They just said that the law is allowed because um, basically the way, folks, if you read this law, the way it, it's a priority thing, it's not saying that they can't be placed with somebody else, but it says that the priority for a child removed from a tribal family should be to attempt to place the child again with a tribal family first. And then if that's not an option to place them with somebody else. Um, and this one, again, a seven to two decision, 53 percent of Americans agree with the Supreme Court, 56 percent Democrats, 51 percent independents and 54 percent Republicans. There's bigger implications here, but I think it goes back to what we've talked about before, which is there's bigger problems with the way that we treat uh, Indians in this country. And that holistically, if we resolve that, some of these other insulary things get resolved, too, because this is an important issue. A lot of people in tribes feel very strongly about this, as they should. Um, but again, it's kind of a, a symptom thing of a larger batch of issues that aren't going to be fixed by the Supreme Court at all, because they're not really Supreme Court things to fix. They're a mess of legislative crap that we've let dangle over the years and drug these people around left and right and never really... Not even a number action. of years. How about centuries? Well, yeah, I mean, forever. <laughs> decades. For, forever. I mean, you <laughs> At know. least decades, if not right. centuries. We make promises that we don't keep and not like, oh, we made one promise a long time ago that we didn't keep. It's like, no, we make promises literally all the time and then change our minds and, and violate now we them. All, I don't think there's anybody out there that would argue that the reservation system is broken in the United States. And the way and what these... American citizens have to deal with is different than almost anything else. I mean, and what are we doing about it? Absolutely nothing. I mean, less than what we're trying to do to change the inner city environment of right. our major metropolitan areas. Which at is inadequate. There, at least there but... are politicians <laughs> addressing those issues. Yep. There are there's hardly nobody, anybody yeah, nobody addressing wants to talk about this. the reservation system and the way we're forcing these Americans to live on these pieces of, of scrub land that we've given them and what we're doing, you know, I mean, every once in a while healthcare will get in there, but healthcare, education, food, job opportunities. And again, it's something that we need to address as a nation much more than we do. So this is a, like you said, a Band-Aid decision that the Supreme Court made that doesn't even come close to solving the problems for the, this section of American citizens. 
So we get to one of the interesting ones this go around that you may not have heard a lot about, but a nine to zero decision for religious employees. The court broadened accommodations that employers must make for workers' religious practices after a postal worker refused to work on Sundays for religious reasons. The post office agreed to help find coworkers to swap shifts with, but when he could not find any coworkers to swap with and did not show up to work multiple times, he was disciplined and then quit. Some people think that this is not religious discrimination. Other people think that this is religious discrimination and that the employer should have to accommodate his beliefs and should not have disciplined him. 51% of Americans agree with the court. Remember, this is a 9-0 decision. 51% agree with the court. 51% of Democrats disagree with the court. 51% of independents agree with the court. And 52% of Republicans agree with the court. Talk about a mess. We are split. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. The court decided 9-0, right? I mean, this is... There, there is no dissent here. Uh, the court said, yep, you know, this is straightforward. Uh, but the American people obviously don't feel that way, which, again, I think would be reflective of what we talked about on some of these other issues of the law is the way that it is right now. You may not like it, but clearly the court feels pretty strongly that the law says, you know, um, that this is how it's going to be. We've had some long discussions with our intern over this kind of issue. And I think the only thing I want to point out very quickly is this worker wanted Sundays off because that's when his religion practices its services. But if I understand this decision correctly, if I'm of a different religion that practices on a different day, this decision would apply now gives me the opportunity to do the same thing. So if I am of a, recognized religion, you know, I can mostly think of the Jewish religion, Saturday being the holy day. They they work on Saturdays, the post office or, you know, yep. anybody who works on Saturdays. Mm-hmm. Well, I would have to have time to go to the synagogue, you know, right. or if there's any other religion that decides to, they want to practice or have services on Tuesday, Wednesday, then this, dis- and that's what people don't think about. They think, yay, my side won because I get to now do what I want. Right. But this kind of be decision upset when other people- also opens up other people. Yeah. And if you run a business or you have employees, it makes it even harder for you then to cover all the hours that need to be covered. And then that may, well, your local business, or in this case, the post office, won't have as many tellers at the window or get your mail delivered as efficiently or sorted. Just understand that. That's all I guess I'm I'm not saying this is a bad thing. I'm saying understand that. It, yes, it was for this person and their religion, but it will apply across the board to all religions. Right. And that's important to recall. And then the other thing I guess is I would say one of the ways that this becomes more of a moot point is um, the better job, right, that's done communicating with workers, job expectations, or the fact that your schedule may be unpredictable or that kind of thing up front, the less likely this is to be a problem at all. I think, you know, I need more research on the details of this, but one of my questions is, did the postal worker know prior to accepting the job that they would have to work on Sundays? Because then then I don't think, I think this is a moot point. It's like, well, if you knew that that was part going to be part of the job, right, and you accepted the job, then you can't be upset that this is part of the job mm, and you don't have to. Not if I have it. the constitutional right, then it, then I do. See, that's why I don't well, want to. I know and we don't want to get into this one. Maybe we right. do, but, but that, I disagree that's the with can you. Can of worms that is going to get opened up by this. Of, I know you're a business owner and you yep. hire people, but I'm like, whoa, dude, you're violating my constitutional rights with this agreement. There could be very broad implications mm-hmm. to this if we're not careful. And there may not be because there, you know, how many people are really, how that many upset. people really know this? How many people are really upset by this? It may not have broad implications, uh, but it could have uh, because there's, again, the what does the law say versus what would the impact of that be? And are we as a society okay with that impact? Right now we're okay well, with that. Well, obviously we're, we're very split. Yeah. I, I, every every group are... was in the low 50s. <laughs> every group supported it, but yeah. they're all in the under 55%. I'd also, I'd also uh, contend that I, I'd imagine part of the reason for this um, split is that this is, this is going to be a more difficult one because of the nuance in it for when you're pulling on this, it's going to be more complicated to make sure that people understand the situation before answering it. Um, not that people are dumb, but it, it has 
it has nuance to it and it has some complexity to it. And, and some and of you the, may make the decision quickly and then not even thought of a couple of things that we've brought right, up. Right. And you'd be like, oh, well, I, maybe I, I don't feel that Ooh. way because this thing, like, oh, I guess you're right. This could be a problem if everybody, you know, if people started taking off Mondays and Wednesdays and Saturdays and, and if, if, and if no employer can ever have anybody work those days, are we okay with half of the week? You know, and then how does it affect me as a consumer when I, when to, I want to do right. business? Right. Well, cause I work Monday through Friday. So my only time to go out and shop, but now you can't be open on it. So, I mean, there's that whole rabbit hole that you could go down. So let's, we're going to talk about, we don't have time to get through everything else, but we want to talk about a couple of the interesting ones um, that were also nine to O two nine to O decisions. Um, one that goes strongly against the public. Um, well, really, uh, b- both. So keep it here on the state of us and we'll be right back. Tech platforms and terrorism in a nine to O decision, the court ruled that the internet platforms may not be sued for aiding and abetting international terrorism by failing to remove videos supporting the Islamic state. Nine to zero decision. Where's the public on this? 72% of all Americans disagree with the court's decision. 77% of Democrats, 72% of independents, 67% of Republicans. So clearly the, the public feels very strong. Well, we want to be, be safe. Yes. I mean, it's, it's just like when they started, sorry, air quotes here, strip searching us to get on an airplane. I remember in classroom saying, that's a violation of my rights. That's search, illegal search and seizure. And 90% of my students said, but Mr. Jackson, I, don't you want to be safe on the airplane? And I said, don't violate my constitutional rights. Okay. That's what I'm worried about because you're opening up a, you know, a, a, a dictatorial state run thing here where they can just, now we're going to walk into your house. No, they just going to make it safe for the airplanes. I said, yeah, but where do you draw the line? So, I mean, I understand why Americans are against it. Why the court rule 9-0? What's their rationale here against, you know, to, to make this decision? I appreciate that they're supporting the Constitution, but what in the Constitution did they interpret that said— No, it's not the Constitution. Oh. Federal law states that social media companies are not responsible for hosting content that is posted oh, by others. You mean that big issue that we talk about— All the time couple times a month yep. about the thing that's been on our that agenda social a lot media lately and what that they don't have to that they're not right. liable and the I mean, fact that we have 80 year old senators who don't have a clue what any of this is and how it all works so right how can they pass a law about something that they don't even understand there's nothing in the constitution that says that there's a problem with that federal law Therefore, that federal law stands and it doesn't matter whether or not people like it. Like, that's the law. So if 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 we don't like it, the court's like, hey, we're not we can't. Seventy five percent of the Americans, three out of four Americans don't like this decision. Maybe that's a note to Congress. Change the freaking law. The last one, uh, the scope of tech platforms liability shield. Oh, tech again. Here we go. <laughs> All right. You save the last save the two best when I'm tired. Okay, the, the, yes. The court sidestepped ruling on whether a law that protects social media platforms from lawsuits would shield YouTube from a suit over videos supporting terrorism. Some people think that large tech companies such as Google can be held responsible when their algorithm recommends certain content to users. Mm -hmm. So the distinction here, right, is the first one that we just talked about is that that a company cannot be held liable for the content that a user puts on its platform, right? Because it didn't create that content. Somebody using its platform created that content. The question here is if your company's algorithm that makes recommendations now recommends one of those videos, you are no longer passively engaging in content distribution, but actively participating in the dissemination of that information. Mm. So if your algorithm recommends it, can you now be held liable for participating in that dissemination? Now, the public says 69% of Americans say that companies should be held responsible if their algorithm participates. Since they created the algorithm, that's their entity. They control that. So therefore, they're liable is the way 
That's the, the way the American the people, people interpret see this, this situation. And the court basically said, we're not addressing that right now. Mm. We're going to address, we're going to address the terrorism thing. We're not going to address partly because if you look at the way the law is written, this is a very gray. The court's looking for guidance. Th yes. The notion of artificially intelligent algorithms and platforms drawing people in for hours at a time and not a couple million Americans, but tens or hundreds of millions of Americans using these platforms. It's a totally different landscape today when it was than when the law was written. And I think part of the court's issue here is even looking at, well, what's the intent of the law? I don't know if lawmakers at that time, if you could say that they could they have even known that this was a possibility sure. when they were writing the law. Technology is changing so quickly right. that it's hard to keep the legal side of it caught up with the advances that technology is making. And again, I think the law is not very clear here on, on, on this. It's very clear on the content being created. But the question becomes, if you, if your company becomes actively involved in promoting access to that content, now have you gone from passive distributor to active participant in whatever that content is, which then in turn would make you liable. It's kind of like- B Bottom line is though, the court's looking for guidance. Right. This is the court's way of saying the federal government needs to pass a law so that we, we don't know can, what to do here. Because right. Because this is we don't have anything on the books right. to base the decision on. Yeah, I mean, and, and again, that was that was unanimous decision by the court of saying right. uh, <laughs> everybody's agreeing. So right. it's not like we don't know yeah. what to do with this. Yeah. Or 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 we don't want to Well, that sends a message. We don't want to step on this. I mean, a nine oh decision, whether saying that the we're public not gonna, likes it or not, right. Or the other two branches of government like it or not sends a message that yep. somebody needs to get on the stick and do something about this. Somebody needs to pay attention. Uh, so why do we do this show today, Lance? Well, because we found it interesting. Get people to pay attention? Yeah. Well, and it's, you know, we're, we're everybody's been bombarded by the court all summer, but this once we wanted to show that, and I think what makes sense is where the Democrats, independents, and Republicans fall on this, on the decisions that were made. And the fact that, you know, if you're hardcore one way or the other, you maybe didn't even recognize that um, the two different sides of the court actually have come together on some issues this summer as well. And there's a few we didn't get to either right. that, that were examples of so that So make sure also. you check out the article and, and yes. look up the ones that we didn't talk about and share those with your family and friends. But the reason we do it is because True Chat has a mission. And our mission is to educate people by providing honest, open, and respectful conversations. And we felt this was something that needed to be shared with you, our listening audience. We hope you enjoyed today's show. Tell your family and friends. And if they'd like to listen on their own, tell them they can find The State of Us as a podcast on Spotify, Overcast, Stitcher, Apple Podcast, and everywhere podcasts are found. The State of Us releases new episodes Tuesdays and Thursdays, first thing in the morning as a podcast. Those same episodes are heard on the weekends on AM and FM radio stations across the United States and parts of Canada. For The State of Us, I'm Justin T. Weller. I'm Lance Jackson. Special thanks to producer Bradley Bush, and thank you all, our audience, for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Be the change. Be sure to check out our website, thestateofus.org, for books, articles, and all the ways to tune in. Thestateofus.org.